What's up everyone, it's uh, Caddy with Money Vesting. So in this video, we are gonna be talking about where I am planning to personally invest a little bit more heavier moving forward and uh, where I'm gonna be actually allocating more of my funds as time goes on, especially in 2023 to better, better prepare for what could be a very important decade for this particular um, country. So I hope you guys enjoy this video, find it helpful. If you do, make sure that you drop a like. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel if you're just joining us for the first time. And of course, don't forget the link to our Discord and Patreon is going to be down below if you're interested in joining us. Uh, there is a 16% discount that you can take advantage of. And uh, as always, we'd love to have you on board in our money vesting community. So recently, there was a World Government Summit of 2023. Elon Musk spoke during that summit. And there was also Ray Dalio that talked during that summit. And uh, I've already started to invest here. And I've already alerted everybody in our Discord. I mentioned that... I am investing in, and the country is going to be India. So there's a, there's a lot of stocks that I actually picked up. I picked up seven stocks in total within the Indian market. Um, and my plan is to continue to keep investing more and more heavily, especially in 2023, to get, kind of build that portfolio up um, quite, to quite, quite, uh, quite substantial numbers so that I can take advantage of what I believe is going to be an exceptionally significant growth phase for this emerging, um, emerging market. And over the next decade or so, or even, you know, 10, 20 years, uh, I do strongly believe, genuinely believe that India can really surpass a lot of countries and, and become a very, very significant leader when it comes to economic growth. Now, this may come across as a little bit more biased because I am in India and I'm, I am uh, an Indian citizen as well. But uh, trust me, when I do talk a little bit about the numbers, I go over what's behind the data. Um, hopefully, you know, you can see the value as well. Again, I'm, this video is not to convince you into anything, but just trying to show you and help you understand um, what the data is showing us and why I'm personally betterly, betting heavily on the Indian economy as well. So first things first, I want to play a clip from Ray Dalio. Um, and that was actually came out literally less than a day. So like 22 hours ago, this video came out um, that I want to play here. And it's only a two minute clip. And then we'll jump over to some of the statistics and some of the data that I want to share with all of you. So I'm going to play this now. We're going to listen in and then I'm going to pause and kind of share my thoughts. India and, and your book, I mean, you talk China, United States, and there is a huge country with tremendous this world. Where is India? India is, a, is the country, I, 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 from all of the statistics using 10-year growth rates and also what, just what's apparent, India will have probably the greatest growth rate, the fastest growth rate economically, have the, uh, the greatest transformation um, of any country. And I would say, like, if I was going to paint the world, there is this great power conflict and lots of go things going on that are great and terrible in both China and the United States. And then there's the countries that are not in that, the neutral countries. So here we are in the UAE, and you think about what's going on here and in Saudi and so on. Or you go to Singapore and you look at what's happening in the ASEAN countries, Indonesia, Vietnam and so on, and you look at India. It's an advantage through all history and world wars. Those that have not been involved in the wars and stand aside from the wars actually prosper from whatever the conflicts exist. So we're going to have different types of wars between those two states, but India is going to be. Now, the dynamic of it is very interesting because it's not really open. You know, it's dominated by a few families. Uh, it's not an easy place to get into. And, uh, it, you know, it, the capital markets haven't de developed it to the extent that they should develop. They will develop probably. So there's a great, great deal of potential. But actually, is there going to be that kind of opening up that is going to create that kind of vibrancy for us all? India will do great, I, th I think. And then the question is, what does that mean for the rest of us? So so to that point, um, I think what Ray Dalio was really talking about, number one, is that from a geopolitical standpoint, India is very neutral, right? We don't like to take sides, right? During conflicts, during wars, India, for those of you who do study geopolitics, uh, never likes to take any anybody's side, right? Very neutral in nature. The second thing he talks about is that there is a lot of... Um, uh, sort of few families that actually do control, um, you know, most of the businesses here, most of the companies, the capital markets are very locked. The liquidity is not that great. In fact, I even mentioned it in our Discord, in our community, 
when I was investing, you know, I think a few weeks ago when I started investing in Indian stocks uh, is that liquidity is an issue, right? It's very difficult to find stocks that have over a million shares traded because, you know, it, it, the Indian markets are not as liquid as that of the United States. So I think there is a lot of untapped potential is what Ray Dalio is talking about, right? When he mentions the closeness and whether that's going to open up and create that vibrancy and create that atmosphere environment for India to grow. And in other words, the markets to also grow pretty substantially. Uh, eventually, in my opinion, I think it will over the next several years out because there's there's a lot of sort of uh, different um ecosystem, there's a lot of different statistics that are kind of having that cross currents together that I will go over. But this is an economic growth for, for India. And you can see how consistently it's been growing since the 1960s, right? There's only been very, very few years where India's economic growth has contracted. And, and that's another thing that I really wanted to point out is that India's economy is actually very risk averse, right? It's not as risk prone. In other words, most of our GDP comprises of agriculture, right? Industrial production, manufacturing. So a lot of those things are going to be needed regardless of what's going on in the world, right? Food, there's never going to be a shortage of food in India because agriculture is a pretty big sector over here. So, and we are exporters of the two biggest commodities in the world. Number one is, of course, agriculture products. So India is one of the largest agriculture product exporters in the world. And during 2021-2022, the country recorded around $50 billion in total agriculture exports with a 20% increase from same time last year. And the second thing is oil, right? So petro petroleum products. Um, and despite uh, India also, you know, having sufficient processing capacity over the years, they have been able to uh, be a pretty much a net exporter in petroleum products as well. So those are the two big commodities that India is able to export, especially agriculture. I think we've got a pretty substantial sector here, which even even during wars, even during conflicts, even during tough times, during recessions, during COVID, whatever is happening, India t tends to be a little bit more risk averse. And that's why you'll notice that the economic growth really has been on this consistent increase and will continue to grow and flourish even more. And it's now starting to really kind of go, you know, move away from that linear growth over to a little bit more compounded growth over, over the years. Now, now, this right here is another really interesting statistic. If you take a look at the demographic, right, the age demographic of uh, the population over in India, which, by the way, just crossed over China at over 1.4 billion, what you'll notice is that the working age, right, so the working age considered to be like somewhere between 18 and 60, right, so you're pretty much working majority of your life between 18 and 60. After 60, people retire before 18, you're in school, you're doing maybe internships, summer jobs, whatever. But the main, you know, working age is between 18, maybe even 20, 22, to as far as 60. You'll notice that that population makes up over 57, almost 60% of the population of India is in the working, their prime age. So it's not like one of those, it's not like a European country, which is, you know, more tilted on the older side or older population, but instead India is extremely young in the way, you know, the population's divided in terms of demographics. And the prime age is between, you know, 15 to 54. That's where 60% of our population is. So talk about productivity, talk about efficiency. I think this can really catapult India's growth over the long term as well. This right here is a paper from, uh, I believe, JP Morgan, if I'm not mistaken, but they pretty much mentioned that India is on track to become the world's third largest economy by 2027, surpassing Japan and Germany, and having the third largest stock market by 2030, thanks to global trends and key investments the country has made in technology and energy. And India is already fastest growing economy in the world, having clocked a 5.5% growth rate in uh, in, I think, the past decade. And in 2023, they're expected to report over 8% growth in uh, in GDP. And uh, Radam Desai from Morgan Stanley says, uh, we believe India is set to surpass Japan and Germany to become the world's third largest economy by 2027 and will have the third largest stock market by the end of this decade. Consequently, India is gaining power in the world order. And in our opinion, these uh, idiosyncratic changes imply once in a generational shift and an opportunity for investors and companies. Um, all told, the GDP could more than double from $3.5 trillion today to surpass $7.5 trillion by 2031. And that's where we are right now. So if you take a look at the GDP for the company, $3.1, $3.5 trillion for the country, not the company, $3.5 trillion. And if you take a look at the debt, right, even the fiscal position for India is actually really good because we're only sitting on about 152 lakh crores, which is roughly translating to about 1.8 to 1.9 trillion dollars 
in debt, right? So this is the debt position of the government of India. So $1.9 trillion of debt, $3.5 trillion of GDP. That's roughly around 60% debt to GDP ratio, which in some of the other countries, right? If you take a look at the United States, it's over 100%. So even on a fiscal side, even on a budget side, India seems to be in a much better position financially uh, compared to, of course, that of um, the United States. And I think China is a little bit over 65, 70% as well. Um, and then another thing that I want to point out is the startup culture, right? There's been a ton. When I say a ton, there's been a ton of startups being launched in India that are obviously creating a lot of employment, creating a lot of wealth, creating a lot of opportunities for uh, for people and businesses over here in India. And uh, as of, I think, August 29th, 2022, over 77,000 recognized startups spread throughout 656 districts were launched. And this makes India... The uh, I think the second or the third. There we go. So India has emerged as the world's third largest startup ecosystem, which obviously is creating a lot of opportunities, like I said, and is curbing that unemployment problem as well. These right here are some of the fastest growing sectors in India, which I will be focusing on. So the companies that I did pick up, uh, I did pick up some companies in fintech, some few banks that are focusing on fintech. I picked up a couple companies in IT. So TCS, uh, you know, consulting services, Infosys, for those of you who don't know, uh, those are companies that I did, bought, uh, did buy a few weeks ago. And then uh, we'll be buying some in infrastructure, fast moving consumer goods. Unilever is another really, really big brand and renewable energy. Those are some sectors that are fastly growing in India, something to work consistently. And of course, there's opportunities uh, in these sectors. Now, for those of you who obviously don't want to uh, invest directly in India, I did mention a ETF, which is INDA, which is an ETF, which does have pretty decent volume. So if you take a look, 3 million average shares are traded, 1.72 million, you know, on, on a daily basis. And the expense ratio is, I think, a little bit on the high side. So once again, you can kind of do additional research on this as well. Um, on this, and but the top 10 holdings for this INDA ETF is very similar to the companies that I've also picked up in my personal portfolio in, in over here in India. But overall, the growth has been very strong and there is going to be some discrepancy because of that USD, USD versus INR hedge. But uh, just wanted to kind of bring this up and kind of share this, you know, with you guys and what I'm actually planning to invest a little bit more heavily in moving forward because I do strongly believe that India has a lot of potential over the next 10 to 20 years and the growth is going to speak for itself. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video, found it helpful. If you did, make sure to drop a like and let me know your thoughts on what you also think um, you know, about this and about India. And this, like I said, I shared uh, today was came out 22 hours ago. So literally very, very fairly new uh, with Ray Dalio's comments on India as well. So uh, let me know your thoughts. I would love to know as always, happy investing. Make sure that you drop a like, subscribe to the channel and the link to our Discord and Patreon is gonna be down below if you want to get access to our alerts or portfolios, all those trade ideas, all that stuff. Uh, but INDA is gonna be the one that I'm personally considering and INDY is another one that are that that you can kind of look at this is the india 50 etf the volumes are a little bit low obviously this is a really really low volume etf only 76,000 shares so there's not going to be a lot of liquidity uh but definitely do some more research on uh etfs that are listed probably in the u.s markets or european markets that can get you a little bit more exposure uh into the indian stock market if of course if you're interested at all um in, in investing in indian stocks so happy investing and i'll see you all in the next video